Namaste. Today is November 8th, and this is the second lecture on Jyotish by Rose. And I'm handing her the control. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Wonderful. So I'm looking at a picture of Ganesh. And Ganesh, you may know, is the elephant-headed deity. And we want to invoke Ganesh today to assist us in knowledge, in wisdom, and understanding. Those are all very different. Um, you can have a lot of knowledge, but lack wisdom. And wisdom comes from the experience. So today we're going to be looking at planets and their energies, but before we do that, I want to review the differences that we talked about last week in the first class. And by the way, I understand this, this is overwhelming, the, the information. Again, Vedic astrology is a vast and complex subject. And like Ayurveda, it is not, it's not one that you can learn from reading a book. It's, it, it really, uh, it, it takes time, first of all, and someone who can guide you, someone who can share their experiences with you. So last week we talked about, first of all, that the Western astrology uses an entirely different zodiac called the tropical zodiac. And the tropical zodiac is a symbolic zodiac where the signs are based on the movement of the equinox. So to, to put that in a somewhat simple way, you can say that Western astrology is really based on the season. There is more of an emphasis on the relationship of the sun and, and the movement to the earth. So the focus really is on the sun. And this Western astrology starts their astrological year in, in Aries at the end around March uh, 21st or 22nd, that date changes. But that's usually the beginning of the spring equinox in that time frame. So this is Western's emphasis is on the relationship of the sun to the earth and the season. And so Western has a different perspective. Then whenever we look at Vedic, Vedic is based on the sidereal zodiac. And so the planets here, we're looking at the planet's actual relationship to the constellation of zodiac stars. The signs are based on fixed stars. The focus here is on the moon sign. And as we go in this class, we're going to talk about the sun's energy and the moon's energy. And I think that, that it will, you will begin to understand the, the differences in the zodiacs more. The sidereal means that, that the planetary movements are really tracked against the positions of the stars. 
So let's look again. Western astrology bases or places the emphasis on the sun sign, which is the outward you, the personality of you. I mentioned last week that it's, it's what, what I refer to as your business card, who you are when you step outside your door, who you, what you portray to the world. This is why when you hear people say, I'm a Virgo or I'm a Capricorn, they are identifying with a personality trait. And so that's, that's Western concept, that they are identifying with those personality traits. Vedic astrology is more concerned with your moon location. Vedic has its roots in consciousness. It's more concerned with your spiritual path, your spiritual potential. So the moon is looked at as giving, uh, is reflective of the mind, giving, giving consciousness. So you, you will hear in Vedic astrology, the moon is always, uh, and, and in India, the, the, the single most important planet, people are really more concerned with your moon sign. Because the reason for that is if the moon is disturbed, if the moon is afflicted, it will greatly influence um, the entire life of a person. How, how can we move forward in life if, if emotionally we are disturbed or it, it's a, it is somewhat like building a foundation. The moon is, is the foundation of who we are. It, it sets the tone. Or who we are and who we become. Now, there, I, I do not want to go too far into the technical part of this, and because this this class, there are five hours of Jyotish, and we we really are introducing you to Vedic astrology. Five hours is is um, is really not a lot of time to to talk to you about um, this, this topic and, and to get into any kind of depth. But what we are doing is showing you the relationship of Vedic astrology to Ayurveda, how it can assist you. It's not teaching you or qualifying you to diagnose. It's just it is introducing you, uh, and it's many layered, and um, it is like weaving a blanket where you take all of these layers and layers of information, just as you're doing in Ayurveda. So I want to touch on this. The difference between Western, the tropical zodiac, and the sidereal zodiac there is a degree difference called the Ayanamsha. And for this class, it's only important that you understand that the degree difference is um, based on the calculation. And because of this degree difference, because of the Ayanamsha, it, it might mean that your, your Western sun is in the sign of Virgo. But if you have your Vedic chart done, your son might have moved back into the sign of Leo. So see the differences between the zodiacs and that degrees different can mean that either your sun sign, your moon sign, or even your ascendant sign could have moved. 
And this, I think, sometimes is what is confusing for people. But how you can put this into context, maybe, or would be helpful, is that wherever your sun sign is in Western is going to be, again, the outer you, how you portray yourself. And we're getting ready to look at the sun and what it means in, in Vedic astrology um, here in just a few minutes. And then you'll be able to apply that. And I think it will clarify some things. And by the way, I read the forums and I really appreciate the feedback from, from any of you on the forums because it's the only way that we know to what, what you, you might be concerned with or if we need to slow down um, so that you can think about how these energies work in your life. The second thing that differs from Western is the philosophy or, or central to Vedic astro astrology is karma and reincarnation. And we spoke on that last week, and I am not going to review that today because we have such a limited time. But so number one is the differences in the zodiacs. Number two is the central theme of karma and reincarnation. And then there's a third called the nakshatras, which we don't get into in, in these classes because it is advanced. It's really an intermediate course. You're learning a foreign language, Sanskrit. You are learning a symbolic language. Astrology is a, a symbolic language. When we begin to look at the charts, you're going to see and be amazed at how much information is contained within a symbol. And then on top of that, you're learning to integrate all of this information. So please be patient with yourself in the process. Okay. Let's begin with. Okay. Bear with me a second. I'm trying to get to our next page. And can one still hear me? Okay. Okay, okay, so the, uh, our learning objectives today are, we're introducing some um, of the planets, the grahas, we're not introducing all of them. Uh, I'm going to slow down just a little so that and you can um, assimilate, think about, and look at how the energies Start noticing how these energies are in your everyday life. We always are considering the four aims of Vedic astrology, our dharma. We're going to look at the houses of dharma, artha, kama, moksha. What is a graha? Graha means to grasp. And today, we're going to look at the sun, energy, moon, Mercury, Mars, and then we're going to look at a chart. This is, this is the chart that we displayed last week, and this is 
the South Indian style chart that we'll be using. And so you read it um, clockwise. And the first half will be in the center of the chart. You're, you're looking at house one is a firehouse connected to our dharma. This is airy. I'm going to go back to this. I'm going to, we'll go, we'll continue to go over and over this because it really does, you have to just keep reviewing this information for it to, um, or, or it to sit with you so that you can understand it. When I first started uh, studying Vedic astrology, I would have dreams about it. And I would dream about the symbol. And so I always talk about the symbols a lot because they, there is so much meaning contained within them. So for a moment, let's just look at the houses. There are 12. This is the equal house. 30 degrees are contained within each house. And each one of you in your chart, Aries might be your first house, but it might be your seventh. It might be your eighth. But we are looking, this is an example of the natural zodiac. So each one of these houses, our dharma, is our life purpose. You know, why we came here. And in your chart will be the, the first, fifth, and ninth houses will be your dharma your creativity, your ability to create. The second house is an earth house. So just look for a moment. Fire, earth, air, going clockwise. Water, fire, earth, air, water. Fire, earth, air, water. Second house is your wealth, what you will do. How The second house in your chart is going to tell how you will obtain your wealth and to what measures you will go to obtain it. It talks about your early childhood. It tells how you speak even how, um, how you will deliver the speech. Third house is 3, 7, and 11 are air signs. They're related to air. They are how we put our ideas out there, how we communicate. And then 4, 8, and 12 are moksha houses. These are spiritual houses that tell how we will release our attachment, what it will give further information about what we might go through to release those attachments. So the chart has all of this information in it and and this is uh, just to say it has this does not even say everything about it so let's look let's look we will con continue to come back to this to review and to look at this because this explains um you know, the houses and, and what they represent. Graha. The word graha means to grab, grasp. The, the, the 
planets rule over different areas of our lives. There are seven planets that Vedic astrologers use. The Sun, Moon, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn. The there, Rahu and Ketu are the nodes, which are called the shadowy planets too, and, and they're called planets, but they're not, they are not really planets. They are just a point in the sky. And the moon, the north node, or Rahu, is where the moon crosses from the south to the north. That's uh, Western will refer to that as the ascending node. And then the uh, K2 is where the moon crosses from north to south, which is referred to as the descending node. It's not important for you to know that. What is important for you to know about the nodes is that they, they are connected with our desires. What what keeps us coming back? What keeps us reincarnating? Desire. Our desires. So Rahu and K2 are, uh, when they are with personal planets, such as if they are with Venus, and depending on the house sign and location in your chart, will will say where you are living your karma, where you are learning lessons. Maybe those lessons are from past lifetimes, and mostly they are, and many they can be from many past lifetimes. But Rahu and K two when they're with a personal planet, will magnify the planets they're with or magnify the energies. And the, Rahu and Ketu can be like wild cards in 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 our lives. We it's difficult to say, you know, how they are going to play out. It's it's like uh, throwing a card out there and you don't you don't know what's on the bottom of it. So the the energy is 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 unpredictable. The Western astrologers use outer planets. The outer planets are uh, Neptune, Pluto, Uranus. They are not really considered in Vedic astrology. They, they will pertain to generational events. And it's interesting, though, that the the Vedic astrologers, the the what we have indicates that that the ancients knew about these planets, even though um, they weren't really discovered until later. Pluto discovered in the 30s. Um, th these so, so I think that's fascinating to know that they knew or had an awareness of them. So they're not really used in, in Vedic by, by some, and I think most Vedic astrologers. So each planet is given rulership over a particular sign. Uh, the sun rules one sign. It ru rules Leo. The moon rules one sign. It rules Cancer. Mercury 
rules two signs, Gemini and Virgo. Mars rules two signs, Aries and Scorpio. Jupiter rules two signs, Sagittarius and Pisces. Venus owns Taurus and Libra, and Saturn owns Capricorn and Aquarius. The ruling planet will always transfer its meaning to the description or to the sign it rules. And you can think of this like um, your landlord. <laughs> it, um, you could say, okay, uh, the house, let's just make, let's just say the house is Leo, the sign is Leo, and it's your first house, and the sun rules it. Probably what each of you know about the sun and maybe what you know about Leo would be that it would give someone with a very uh, energetic and commanding uh, ascendant sign, someone who really projects a lot of energy. And, and you would be right. The sun in the first house would give a dynamic person. So each planet carries, and that depends also on where other uh, planets are located, but it will cause that person to, to shine. Each planet carries information about the, the outer you and the inner you. So let's take a look at the sun. Parashua said the sun has yellow eyes, which dispense honey. His body is square. He is pure, bilious, pitta in constitution, intelligent, masculine, and tends toward baldness. That's a lot. <laughs> so we get a picture here of the sun. The sun is the, the life-giving source of the planet. It's energy. If the sun is in the sign of Leo and it's in the first house, yes, that person at some point in time will possibly suffer baldness, depending on where other planets are located. But this is just tiny bits of information that we're going to build on. The sun rules Leo. What is the symbol for Leo? Everyone knows. Simha, the lion, Pitta dosha, hot, forceful. The sun is known as the Atmakarika or the soul indicator. So where the sun is in your chart reveals who you are in your heart. It tells your, about your spirit, your character. The sun rules uh, overconfidence, and it gives a person, a strong sun would give um, a person authority in life. It would give them power and status. And it has rulership over the father. Of course, many presidents have very strong sons because of that authority and the power that they're given in life. So we want to look at uh, the, the key words for the sun are atma, self, soul, your physical body, your life force. Courage, pride, stamina, power, fame, royalty. Kind of see where that all fits in? Father, government, authority, kings and bosses, presidents, ego, control. Son is um, people who are in authority 
It rules over those in authority. It rules over kings and presidents. It, in medical astrology, it rules the heart. It, it's who you are in your heart. It would make sense that it rules over your heart. It's associated with blindness, baldness, the eyes, the vision, the right eye in particular, headaches. This is, is, does this make sense to you all, that the sun and the how this energy works? Is this? So, we right away the, we 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 are learning that the correlation between Ayurveda and Vedic astrology we see Pitta. The sun is Pitta. So this is the sun is the lunar force. So let's look at the moon. The moon is the feminine. I'm sorry. Yes, the sun is the solar force. The moon is the lunar force. The the moon it rules over our peace of mind. This is why. The moon is such an important planet in our chart. It, move, it rules over our comfort, our general well-being. The moon also rules over the masses. The moon likes to be supported by other planets. It, it likes to have other planets around it. So why would, why would you think that, that it likes to have other planets around it if it's our emotional, if it's the indicator of our emotion? Because it, it feels isolated. If, if, if it feels non-supported. If, if we do not feel supported in life, it makes it, makes it difficult. Right? If we don't feel we have support in life, we do not feel empowered to move ahead. And so the moon likes it better when it's supported by other grahas, by other planets. Both the sun and the moon are trouble when they're near the nodes. Rahu and Ketu. Rahu and Ketu representing our desires. Why we're why we keep coming back. So you you will hear over and over again how important the moon <clears throat> excuse me, the moon is in your chart. It it plays the role of balance. Where where have we heard that word before? Balance. Ayurveda. The moon and the ascendant together will reveal a person's tendencies, their affinities. It will tell you how that person is set up emotionally. So. We've already talked about if the moon is weak, the person may be sick or, or, or have a disturbed mind. Weakness of the mind, weakness of, of, the, of the physical body and the mind will reduce the quality of your life. And so that's why we keep looking to the moon. Where is the moon? 
the moon transits or travels through a sign every two and a half days. So this is the reason for um, the emotional changes that we all um, that we all have in our lives is because it travels. The moon is a very fast moving planet, the fastest moving planet. So the moon has rulership over the mother. Where the moon is in your chart will tell you more information about your mom, about your relationship with your mother. It tells about your relationships with females, your mind, your emotions. The moon rules over the public. If someone has a moon in the 10th house, the 10th house is the house that deals with your profession, your career, it will bring that person before the public. It will mean that that person uh, can affect the masses. The moon rules over the masses, over many, many people. So let's look at the keywords. Mother, mind, emotions, your intuition, your imagination, your memory, your fluids and watery things, kapha, femininity, high and low tide. Some years ago, I worked in uh, a hospital operating room, and I also worked in labor and delivery. We always knew when the moon was full that we were going to be very busy. Why? The moon rules the tides. If it can affect the low and high tides, of the ocean, it can affect the fluids in our own body. It rules the home, habits, your subconscious mind, the night, and sensitivity. A strong moon gives one the, it gives a person a nurturing attitude in life. How do you think that would be helpful? And if, if it's not a nurturing attitude, how do you think that it would be detrimental? Be interesting to see your thoughts on that on, on the forum. And the moon is a planet that we will talk about, you know, throughout the next classes. So does anyone have a question here on the sun's energy or the moon's energy and how the, the moon is actually considered to be kapha and vada? Um, Parashua said, the moon is watery and airy, kapha and vada. She is intuitive and has a round body. She has a luminous countenance. Sweet speech is changeable and moody. Okay, so there's no questions on the sun's energy or the moon's energy. You know, you can begin to look now at your day and 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 begin to notice how these energies come into your life and how they are there throughout your day, every minute of your life. Mercury. Mercury is the winged messenger who is considered to be the messenger of the gods. So Mercury's domain is is everything to do with all forms of communication, with trade and commerce. 
this is huge. Um, you can look at mercury as translating into uh, what what we are doing now. Uh, it translates to Facebook, cell phones, texting, um, tweeting, every every form of communication that you can think of. Mercury governs speech and writing and publishing. Parashwa said, Mercury has the best appearance, is witty, fond of jokes and laughter, is learned. He takes upon himself the nature and constitution of the planets with which he is associated. What does that tell us? He's got a great sense of humor, right? Mercury enjoys having fun. Mercury is actually a, a, a jokester. Mercury, if you have a friend who likes to play jokes, then he or she has a strong Mercury. Mercury is a mutable planet, meaning that it will take on the indications of the planet it's with. It's usually always near the sun, but sometimes there are other planets too. So it, Parashwa says he takes upon himself the nature and constitutions of the planets that he is associated with. So Mercury rules over two signs, Gemini and Virgo. Most of you know that the symbols here for Gemini is the twins. The symbol for Virgo is the Virgin. The dosha is Vata. Medical astrology has it ruling the, the lungs, hands, arms, nervous system, nervous system, intestines, nerve disorders, brain diseases, epilepsy. These are just some. These are not all. And, and by the way, uh, Western astrology, uh, there were some questions on the forum about that. If you have a background, there there may and probably will be some differences. It may be that you, um, as Monica had suggested, unlearn what you know there to learn Vedic. In um, Michael Jackson comes to mind here uh, for me. I um, studies his chart, but he had a really strong third house. The third house is the hands, the arms, and and communication. And and so you all will remember that he was a very good dancer and um, a, an incredible entertainer. But um, so you, as we go along, you'll begin to see how, how these energies operate. But Mercury, one of the things that Mercury is concerned with is the circuitry in the body, circuit. So it would make sense that it, it 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 is connected with the nervous system. Am I going too fast? Okay. Mars. Mars, the god of war. In Vedic astrology, Mars gets gets a pretty hard um, reputation and and earned, you know, because he he is the god of war. But um, let's look. Parashwa said that he is that Mars is cruel, has blood red eyes, is ill mannered yet generous, is bilious, pitta in constitution, is prone to anger, and possesses a thin waist and body. Mars rules over the signs of Aries and Scorpio. Aries is the ram. Aries people will, Aries rising, will sometimes look very ram-like in appearance. Their nose, their hairline, their face shape. So, as I mentioned before, symbols uh, play an important part. The scorpion is the symbol for Scorpio. 
Mars is a hot, red, dry planet. So Mars right now is uh, transiting, moving through the sign of Leo. And so Mars movement through Leo can, if, if you are Leo rising, um, you probably have a lot of energy right now, possibly. But also there could be some dehydration. So Mars is, is the planet that, that deals with our energy, our passions. Mars is the planet of power, of strength, of courage, and aggression. Wherever Mars is in your chart will say where you will expend a lot of energy. Okay, Mars is is a very independent planet. It, it does not uh, like to take orders. So whenever I look at Mars, I, the, all the great generals um, that we've had had to have an incredibly strong Mars, n not just for um, being uh, – commanders and, and the energy, but um, the, the self-confident, the Mars is a very strategic thinking like energy. So if, if a person has Mars in the first house and it's in the sign of Aries, they're, they're, they're very always thinking about moving forward. Mars is not an energy that looks at um, moving slow. Mars gives independence and self-confidence, and Mars on an extreme level can turn into violence and aggression. And we are seeing that now, you know, in our world. Um, Mars, again, is transiting through the sign of Leo. So Mars is considered a malefic planet, but without the energy of Mars, we we really would not be able to to get anywhere uh to move forward in life um so all of all of the planets play a significant and important role um if you have an emergency in your life it's a martian person <laughs> It is a, and when I say Martian, I mean it's a Mars-like quality person that you want there. Why would that be? Because they are fast thinking. They make decisions quickly. They move ahead. They're looking for the most expedient route to um, to do the, um, to accomplish their goal. Mars is very goal oriented. So if Mars is operating on a lower level, uh, it can make a person violent. It, it can make them be be quick to be angered. Um, Mars is causes accidents because of the quick quickness of it. Mars gets involved in fights. This energy. But if it is operating on a higher level, it gives a person incredible understanding. It, it gives them, it, it makes them a spiritual warrior. You know, I, they have, they can harness that energy. So Mars is good for uh, rituals, for any kind of spiritual discipline. Even though Mars is is thinking about movement, Mars is really good for meditation because that energy is is directed. The energy is intense and focused. Mars energy relates to fire, so the fire this can be the fire that 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 you where you warm up the room and, and, and people are 
uh, feel that energy, the warmth of that energy, or it can be the, the fire that burns and destroys uh, the person or other people. So Mars is powerful for good or bad. And, and where it is in your chart will we'll tell what you are passionate about, will say what you are motivated to do. It will, it will give more information about whether or not you will exert any additional effort to, to get to reach your goal, to attain your goal. The key words for Mars are energy, action, passion, fire, blood, sexual vitality, muscles, courage. Mars rules over soldiers. Mars rules over firemen, policemen. Um, Martian type people will be attracted to Martian type careers. Mars is strength and determination. Ruling enemies, accidents, war, criminals, police, science, weapons, guns, knives, property, real estate. It's a carica for brothers. Uh, Mars, in medical astrology, it rules the blood. If you are having to have surgery done, you want Mars in a good location in your chart because you want the precision of that surgeon. You want that person to, to know surgeons are a very uh, Martian occupation. And Mars rules over the head, bleeding, headaches, fevers. Mars is hot. Mars rules inflammation, surgery, injuries, accidents, burns, bone marrow, rules the muscular system. We're going to be looking at um, a chart in, I believe it's the next class, where we're looking at someone with an incredibly strong Mars. And, and looking at how that energy played out in his life. So Mars rules over cuts and bruises. This is a chart that is, it's not all, it doesn't include all the planets here, it does include the Sun, Moon, Mars, and Mercury. And for now, really, you you might want to focus on uh, the colors, and we'll get into the colors more in, in remedial, because we'll do the association of the colors with each planet. And the gemstone that will be of interest for remedial. And then at the very bottom, each planet rules a day. The sun rules Sunday. The moon rules Monday. Tuesday belongs to Mars. Wednesday to Mercury. Thursday to Jupiter. Friday belongs to Venus and Saturday. Saturn to Saturday. So I wanted to speak a little about an important transit that is coming up. Um, it's coming up November 15th. It's the planet Saturn will be transiting, moving out of the sign, the constellation of Virgo, where it's been for the past two and a half years. 
and it's going to be moving into the constellation of Libra. So has anybody been experiencing frustration? Whatever area that there has been frustration, and Saturn is a planet that deals with frustration. So the movement of Saturn into Libra is significant. For those of you who have Virgo planets, planets in the sign of Virgo, it'll be a relief for Saturn to move out and move into Libra. Saturn is known as the taskmaster. So it, it means that it, Saturn wants us to do the work, the necessary work, whatever that is. So it's known to be a planet that deals with our, our karma and it creates obstacles and restrictions, delays and barriers. And we'll, we will go over Saturn in the next class because we broke this class uh, in, in oh, we, we split it in two so that we could slow down a little bit so that people could begin to integrate and, and begin to understand um, that this is a lot of information. So the feeling of Saturn can be restrictive because the energy moves slow and it creates frustration. So wherever Saturn is in your chart, if it's in your 10th house, it's possibly created career restrictions or um, obstacles. Saturn really is a planet that holds our feet to the fire, so we have to be accountable and responsible. Saturn's transit through Virgo. Virgo is the sign that's connected with health and healing. And so you all have seen how, how much that has changed in, in our world today, the way that we receive and will receive health care. Saturn has really changed that in the sign of Virgo. And so it, it, people are becoming more knowledgeable about their own personal responsibility for their individual health, which is uh, uh, perfect and wonderful news for those that are learning Ayurveda. Saturn will transit through Libra for the next, <clears throat> excuse me, three years, which is an unusually long time. So the focus here will be on the relationship. Libra is the sign that is most concerned with our relationships. And Libra is very, the, the symbol of Libra is the scales. And so it's really all about balance. The, the scales of justice want balance. So our relationships, if our relationships are out of balance, and this can be relationships with our spouse, uh, our, our business relationship, relationships um, with other countries, relationships of all kinds, Saturn will want to make the correction. It will, it will, it will show us where where we need to do the work, what what we need to do. Libra is a sign that's concerned with um, politics, so you'll see Saturn's effects outwardly here. And Saturn is vata-like in, na in nature, so, so it's going to create more dryness, more drought, possibly weather. It's very erratic now, but tornadoes. But Saturn will be in the sign of Libra until November the 2nd of 2014. So it's going to go retrograde and be in the sign of Libra for an unusually long time. So I wanted to just touch on that and give you that because that is a major that that is a, a considered a major transit for everyone and will be it will affect depending on where your personal planets are um, where Virgo and Libra are in um, planets that are located there the houses. That's what it will affect. Did any students miss the 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 differences we were talking about in Western, uh, the tropical zodiac and the sidereal zodiac, Vedic? 
the Vedic zodiac is the tropical, I'm sorry, the sidereal zodiac and Western is the tropical. Did anybody come in late? For that, I just want to make sure that everybody uh, has the review. Okay, um, so let me let me just go over um, the what we were talking about. Vedic astrology is uses the sidereal zodiac, and so this zodiac is the planet's actual relationship to the constellation of zodiac stars. The, the sidereal system is the sun's position in relation to the sky. So sidereal means that the planetary movements are tracked against the position of the stars. So the, if we stepped outside on the night or day of your birth and we took a picture of the night sky, it would be where all the planets are and what is rising on the eastern horizon at the time of your birth. That, that is the sidereal zodiac. And then if western zodiac, in contrast, is based on the tropical zodiac. Western astrology is based on the tropical zodiac. So the tropical zodiac is is really a, a symbolic zodiac. It's based on the season. Um, so the focus is really on the sun. So that's where um, Western astrologers start their year at the at the uh, spring equinox, which is um, March twenty twenty first twenty second. It changes. Um, every year. So wherever the spring, whatever day the spring equinox starts on, that's where Western starts their astrological year in Aries, the sign of Aries. Aries is associated with the spring. Western emphasizes the relationship of the sun to the earth and the season. So the when you hear somebody talk about their, their sun sign, Usually they're, they're referring to Western astrology and they're talking about their personality, you know, how, how we are with, with our friends, how we are, how we show ourselves to the world. So that's why people identify themselves as, as, as Aries, you know, I'm Aries or I'm Cancer or I'm Virgo, that they identify with a personality trait. Now, contrast this to Vedic for a moment, and Vedic has its roots in consciousness. So it's really, Vedic is more concerned with your moon, whereas Western, again, is concerned with the sun sign, the outward view. The moon is looked at as giving consciousness. It, it, it's looked at as representing your consciousness. So it's the significator of your mind and how, how your mind operates. If, if it's disturbed or afflicted, it will greatly impact your life if the moon, if your mind is disturbed, it will interfere. And you can think of it as, as a foundation for your life, that it would interfere with with your being able to achieve or move forward in your life. So there's, there's two different methods. There's Western using the tropical zodiac and Vedic astrology using the sidereal zodiac. So they're, they're each based on a different calculation. And the measurement is called the Ionamsha. Because of the difference between the different calculations, your uh, you can be um, a 
your son might be in Scorpio in, in Western, but it might have moved back into Libra. I think someone posted that on the forum that, that their, um, I think Olga might have posted that on the forum where her, her she real, recognized that uh, the sun might have had moved back into a different sign in Vedic. So your, your sun sign could have moved as well as your moon and your ascendant sign. But remember that Vedic is more concerned with your spiritual path and your spiritual potential. So one, you, you might say one is looking at the outside you and the other is looking at the inside you. And then um, we, we spoke on the second thing that, that makes Vedic astrology different is the karma and reincarnation. We spoke on that last week and Monica went into the uh, different types of karma. We, we touched on that. <clears throat> And then the third thing, which we don't get into in this class, because this is an introductory class, and, and it's not, not meant to do anything other than to introduce you, um, you know, and, and give you a very, very basic understanding so you can see the relationship to Ayurveda. But the third is the nakshatras. Vedic astrology uses the nakshatras, which are um, – the nakshatras are the um, different um, – moon, uh, not Shachas was known to be the wives of the moon, but it goes into the different um, placements of the moon. So we're not really going into that because it is, you know, advanced and intermediate. Did that help with clarifying the difference in the tropical zodiac, the Western astrology, and how Vedic astrology uses this sidereal zodiac. Good. Okay. So, it, so please post your uh, comments or questions on on uh, the forums, and I will see you all next week. Thank you.